Hey y'all, it's Renegade, and it's time to spill more reality as we discuss this unhinged second episode of Survivor 46. And I'm still trying to process what exactly went down tonight, if I'm being entirely honest. Uh, but thankfully tonight, as well as every night, I will be joined by a member of our community draft team, where we'll kiki about all the drama. And tonight, my guest is another community member whose passion for reality TV truly rivals my own. I know whenever a new show comes out that I could always come running to this guy to spill some tea, so I'm extremely excited to hear what his insight is for tonight. Let's welcome the one and only Doug Dimidab to the podcast. Doug, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty gouda tonight. Excited to talk about this really messy episode of Survivor, and I'm living for this mess. Honestly, though, I am like I said, I don't even even recall what happened here. Like, I'm I feel like we had to watch the episode again just to try to figure out what was going on here because this hour long, or sorry, yeah, this two hour long episode uh, was packed full of content. Um, and I'm just honestly just very unexpectedly did not see this cast going off the rails the way they did. Uh, do you have any words for what you have witnessed tonight? Just initially hear your thoughts. Uh, Banu. Just Banu. <laughs> Banu is, is a star and I'm I'm very intrigued to see where his story is going <laughs> moving forward. Because he, wow, the mess that is Banu. Uh, but we'll definitely get into uh, a lot more of that, I'm sure, here in the podcast later on here. Uh, before we do so, Doug, um, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about your viewership with uh, the show here. Uh, I know you and I have had some pretty fun uh, talks here about your history with the show and how you initially started watching. Uh, but tell everybody else here, uh, when did you start watching and what keeps you coming back? Uh, I initially started watching Kageya with my mom and sister. And then back then we just... Uh, Skip fast forward through the tribal councils, but now what keeps me watching is all the trauma in the tribal councils and like this season, how messy a season can be, and also the strategy. I have to ask: Have you ever gone back through with your mom and had a second viewing and actually watched the tribal councils and realized what you were missing out on? <laughs> Uh, no, nah, second viewing, but then once I started to really get into Survivor, I was like, no, we gotta watch the Tribal Councils. And I think, like, one of the things I was happy to do that was Edge of Extinction, where they literally had a commercial break in between one and the middle of one of the Tribal Councils. I remember that. The Julie boot. Was it Ju No, the Julia boot. It was the yeah, Julia. 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 The passenger was, or the driver. <laughs> honestly edge of extinction is i would say is a pretty underrated season if you don't watch it for the outcome and really watch it for the drama it's a really good good season like there's a lot of good strategy on it but yeah and rick Devins just steals the show with that season i mean we could talk about Devins uh, in a lot of different ways here but um <laughs> Um, I'd say, actually, speaking about that, though, um, other than Devins, I know you do love Devins, um, who is your favorite Survivor castaway, and what would you say is your favorite Survivor season? Uh, I don't know if I have a, one particular favorite. I, I know Sanders up there for me, and Tony, they're both two-time winners and just grades at the game. Also, another favorite winner would be Mike Holloway. Oh, Worlds Apart Mike? That's a shocking, yes. shocking choice there. I I really enjoyed the character arc from being at the very top to going to the very bottom and then fighting his way, being immune at every single immunity to basically get his own way to the final three. And then being able to convince people like a Dan who he had wronged to vote for him. You no, know, I won't lie. I was a huge Carolyn stan. I was rooting really hard for Carolyn that season. But I do agree, out of all the people that, uh, all the winners that we've had that I think have been like that underdog status that have gone from like top to bottom, like the Bens and the ones like, and people like that, um, Mike's definitely my favorite as well, too. So I, I, I get what you're saying there. I get it. Um, what's your favorite yeah. season? Oh, I was uh, going with <laughs> Mike Holloway, Worlds Apart, definitely one of my favorite seasons. Another probably controversial pick would be Game Changers. I just love. The entire season, the music, the theme, the gameplay, the travel council where Malcolm went. I know people do not like that, but I love that. I was just like, oh my god, they're actually talking to each other and having to have group huddles. I was just so excited. I've watched that like four or five different times over. 
Game Changers, very controversial pick. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could definitely say that. I would never, I definitely don't think I could put Game Changers in my top group. Um, but I definitely know, I, I, I think I could get why you like it, though, because there are some pretty epic strategy moments that I don't think happen in any other seasons, especially just based off of a lot of the twists. And it does have actually a, a pretty good cast for the most part, um, even though they all get eliminated in the first half of the season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pearl Islands would have to be probably my number one favorite season because of just Classic. Sandra, Rupert, having Johnny Fairplay, even Burton and Lil, and Dara, who doesn't get much screen time, was great. And all of the characters on that season was top tier. I would agree with that, too. I think Pearl Islands is definitely in my top three, for sure. After this episode, I honestly think that Survivor 46 could possibly be on its way up there as well, too, just because what did we just watch here? Um, like, I, I'm still just so confused. There was so many tears from start to finish. Like, have you seen a cast like this be this emotionally unstable? In a long time. Like, I know we had Brandon and Hannah last season, but, like, this feels like it's everybody. I think this might be the modern season of Gabon, where everyone, everything was just all over the place. And I have a feeling with this season where we got people who, oh, they might be strategically good, but then they're going to be taken away so quickly. Like, uh, maybe a Kenzie, who seems, like, before the season, everyone was probably thinking she might be a winner. But I have a feeling she probably won't. Kenzie was one of my winner picks, so I could see that. But it, I definitely see this being a very cutthroat season. Like even at the challenge, it felt like there was this this intensity that I I haven't seen in in, in a show recently like this. I'm just getting this it's, vibe from this people that it, there's they all really want it, and they don't care if they have to be a little negative to get it. I don't think we've really seen this type of tribe versus tribe mentality since maybe like South Pacific. Yeah, it is where, very like very tribe cohesive. Like they they want to stick with their original tribes, which is weird, right? Like, uh, yeah, I, it doesn't feel modern Survivor. But I also know a lot of these people are um, people that picked up the show during the pandemic. So I don't know if we're going to be seeing like people that that really have a long history of the show that have seen it like evolve from like start to finish, or even I'd say as far as when you started watching in Kageon, even then so much has happened from the show. I feel like if you're kind of somebody that maybe has binged it like recently, you're not going to get just the nuances and why things changed and so i feel like that's why especially like last season two where we had a lot of newer players i think that's why we're seeing this kind of shift into this really extremely messy gameplay where it's very fast doesn't seem as thought through <laughs> as, as, um, yeah. as you know the class seasons do but also it could be because there's also a lot less time too i mean they have 26 day, 26 days now they have to make decisions in two days versus three. So, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think the game is probably moving a bit too quickly because, like, I've seen where sometimes they, after a challenge, they have maybe three hours before Tribal Council, so that's really not too much time to be able to get a very thought-through plan, especially once you're dehydrated and starving and not in the best mind space already. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of a big part of why we're seeing so fast and pretty sloppy gameplay. Yes, I, I, I think something you mentioned there about the game being too fast, I do agree with that there too. And I don't know if it's necessarily like a bad thing entertainment-wise, because we're, we're seeing a lot of just kind of like messiness. But I don't know if we're ever going to see someone that... Or maybe we're just not at that era yet where we're going to see like the Boston Rob, the Parvati, that you know that that mastermind really step up and be able to use the new format to its its advantage here. Um, I'm hoping that maybe we see that because there's a few people on a couple of these tribes, um, as we'll get into here, that it seems like they could be on the right path. But I also think we're living in an era here where everybody is aware of everybody else and it's very difficult to be that player that is really in control as it seems like a lot of the people we thought that were kind of going to be on top and not have like a lot of pushback 
are now receiving pushback, I think, this episode. Yeah, like, I know one of the big characters so far in just the two episodes has been Tevin, and uh, whenever if Brandon can get that idol, I don't know if he can stay till the merge. Yeah, let's go ahead. Actually, let's go ahead and talk about the the Orange Tribe here first, because they seem to be the uh, maybe not the stars necessarily. I think that might be Purple, but that's because Purple is going to Tribal Council a lot. But Orange is also getting a lot of focus as, like, I'd say maybe the tribe to beat. And from what we've kind of gathered, I, I think you're definitely right that Devin is absolutely the social strategist on this tribe. And he's, as we learn here, he is pretty much good with everybody except for Venus. Now, Soda gets clued in on this from Tevin, and Soda was initially close to Venus, as we saw in the first episode, but it seems like now she's really starting to distance herself and form this trio with Hunter and Tevin as well, too. And based on how she's distancing herself from Venus, Venus now gets the vibe that she realizes that she's on the outs, as Tevin doesn't have a relationship with her, and she's now realizing that she could be in big trouble here. Yeah, I, I feel like it's a bit weird that we really haven't, we didn't see Venus be very distant to Soda, like being this cold person. We were being told by Soda. Well, then on the flip side, when Venus is talking about, oh, Soda's being selfish, we get actual flashbacks to her just taking the idol from her. Oh my god, that idol flashback was so random. <laughs> And um, I actually, that's something I definitely want to talk about here because I feel like for me, especially from the premiere, there seems to be something missing from this whole conversation with Venus. Because especially with like Randon, Randon is saying like he couldn't trust Venus and he immediately was, you know, untrustworthy or getting untrustworthy vibes from her. But we never really got a sense from that why they would pick that up other than the fact that she's just you know, being herself. But also she does say that she was willing to be sneaky, so I'm not sure if they're just kind of reading into the fact that she has the capability to do it, or if it's a situation where she is actually doing something that maybe we're just not being edited to see. Um, I I have a, a weird narrative gap here on the Orange Tribe, personally, and that, that gives me a little pause for concern there. Yeah, like in the first episode, we were being told that, oh, Randon found her looking for the idol, but what, we're being sh- what we were shown is Venus going up to him, not him going, oh, let me walk up to you, and she's like freaking out. She voluntarily tells him. So that's like very strange. Right? Like, it doesn't feel like things add up to some degree. And especially because in this episode, we find out that Venus is looking for the idol while so is Hunter and Randon, and Randon is the one that actually finds the beware advantage. Um, So he takes it, he loses his vote officially until his tribe loses the challenge, and he gets the second clue, much like Tiffany did in the premiere. But to make things come full circle to some degree, he kind of realizes the only person he can trust with this information given that Hunter, Tevin, and Soda are a strong trio, and Liz is Liz, which we could get into in a couple seconds here. Um, But um, what do you think about his thoughts on the fact that he went to Venus, and do you think that this duo will actually be tight moving forward? I think this might be such a messy season that Brandon and Venus, who shouldn't be able to have of an alliance together might actually be able to have one because of just how crazy it seems like it ha- has been so far. And I think that they will be able to take out Tevin with the idol. I will, I will agree with you on that in that it seems like this is going to be a very fluid cast in that they, I think they all know to some degree that they could have open like openly dislike somebody, but I, I don't get a vibe from many of these people that they would knowingly just like write somebody off just because they don't like them. It seems like everybody's kind of willing to like, you know, if it's going to get me one step ahead, I would kind of do what I need to do. And I would kind of actually wouldn't mind these two, um, you know, turning into a secret strong duo uh, that, you know, ends up flipping the game later on if um, Orange becomes, like, the power tribe and wins too much. 
So I'm, I'm definitely have my eyes on both of them, even though I would say I definitely would edge Venus over Rand in, in this situation. Yeah, it would be a crazy world to live in where the three last people from this tribe would be Liz, Venus, and Brandon. Do we really see a world here, though, where Liz doesn't go first? I I can't imagine them ever... Actually, that's not true. Because she has built up this persona that she does not need this money, and I don't get why she keeps talking about it. Like, Liz and herself, I feel like she she could just have an hour-long episode dedicated to her and just the 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 strange... Like, I, I don't know what her strategy is. Do you know what her strategy is? I, I don't know what she's doing. I think her strategy is to say how much money she has, so then people are willing to take her to the end and then maybe somehow trying to explain that and use that as her way to win, maybe? I, I think she's just trying to get to the final three, and I don't think people... She might think, oh, I can take her to the final three because she has money and people won't vote for her. I could see that happening. Now that she's not, like... If she's not the first boot from her tribe, I could easily see her kind of being drug along as somebody that, like Jeff was saying in the beginning, that is the person that's going to instantly not win. Even though I don't believe in that, I still don't believe in that. Um, like actually, I kind of want to take, get your take on that because I kind of feel like that was like my my takeaway from this is Jeff is on one on this season and he has some very strange takes that I'm that I'm getting here. <laughs> I feel like it wasn't really personally directed to anyone on the season. I have a feeling it was personally directed like Russell Hans, who in every single season, no matter who he went to the end, he was always going to lose. Thing is, though, even Russell, though, if he changed his social game and was slightly not of a dick, even he could have a chance to win. That's why I yeah. don't. I don't agree with that. That inherently, one person on the cast is going to get, be guaranteed to lose because it all comes down to you know the inner mindset and the ability to game as far as I'm concerned. And maybe maybe that's what they're saying, is that they purp- purposefully cast people that are going to be terrible. Which I wouldn't be surprised with. Yeah. But as far as like an internal mindset thing, I just I don't know if that was the best thing to tell these people before they got on this island. Because I feel like it is just resonating in this messy-ass game. <laughs> You're telling people to live their truths, and now Liz is just like, I'm awesome, and look how awesome I am, because I make so much money. And I'm just like, Liz... Stop. And I own 10 companies. <laughs> and, you know, like, someone else I feel like that needs to stop a little bit here, and, and we, we might shift a little bit here to um, uh, maybe the green tribe here, um, is Charlie. And I'm like, Charlie. Oh, yes. And Charlie and the Taylor, the Taylor Swift. Like, get another personality trait other than Taylor Swift. Please. I, like, I've had to so deal with the Swifties for the entire NFL season now with Survivor. And it's like too much too much here taking over and like, is is she going to be at the reunion like i hope she's going to be at the reunion I, don't. I hope i hope that maybe that's charlie's um loved one visit is taylor swift so this like, like goes somewhere instead of getting a c award we're getting a taylor swift award oh lord <laughs> <laughs> no that's yeah, maybe we should stop talking about that because I feel like we're just like, <laughs> yeah. to incite something here. Let's, let's get back to some facts here. So, um, anyway, I think the 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 Sega tribe here, um, was really like the story of Ben and Charlie. This episode, like it, everything, pretty much had to do with one of the two of them. Um, Ben is absolutely getting like the personality award here. I think actually what I thought Banu was, they were trying to give to Banu with like the fan favorite, like the, the most likable guy, person who's probably like always has, like a <laughs> good attitude. I think that's actually Ben. As much as I don't really vibe with him as much, um, I, I'm starting to warm up to him a little bit. He's not as the shred thing is still kind of uh, like, do we, do we need to have a catchphrase? Um, but I also understand branding, so I'm, 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 what are your thoughts on Ben? It seems like they're trying to make him, like, a Cody type of character that's, like, he's so, like, carefree and seems like, and all, just all this energy, and that's, 
I don't know how well that's going to do in the game because it's going to eventually really go between Charlie and Maria. And mm-hmm. depending on how they go with the girls or the boys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we learned this episode too that uh, it looks like Charlie and Maria are officially the ones that both of the sides want because uh, Tim and Ben basically are on one side. Uh, they think that it's men versus women, so they obviously they want to pull Charlie in, and they want Maria because she has the extra vote, whereas Charlie is the gay, question mark? So obviously he would be the one that the women would want on their side. So big uh, deal made about this alliance that Charlie and Maria made tonight, that they decided to want to become Denise and Malcolm 2.0. And the fact that Maria was like, I want to be Denise, I kind of low-key was like, is is this Maria's winner story? Are we getting a winner's arc from her? I'm I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are and if you think that Maria could possibly be Denise 2.0. I think there is a possibility. It's just she won't have the story about going to every single tribal council, but having that flashback to Malcolm and Denise, when I don't think we've ever really on a flashback like that, talking about people saying that they're... I think last season they had, like, oh, yeah, we're going to be JT and Fishback. I don't think we had a flashback to that. But this season, we had that. So that's really, really interesting. And that probably gives Murray a really good chance of winning right there. The fact that she has the extra vote, I think that just means that right now she is literally in control of Sega. She can decide who goes when. Um... I kind of get the feeling, I think I know which way she's going, just kind of based off of what we've seen a little bit in the edit here. Um, But honestly, I kind of could really see anything happening to the outside of them. Like, I feel like Jem and Mariah haven't really gotten any sort of screen time. I don't really know much about them, whereas I know a lot about Ben. I know a lot about Charlie. And him gets a lot of focus as, like, the the anti-women alliance sentiment. So... I wonder what that means for Jem and Maria, Mariah, if if that means that they, one of those two possibly could be the first boot, if Maria maybe does go with the men. Um, but I, I'm very kind of curious to see where this all goes, if it goes anywhere. I'm also curious what's going to happen with the extra bow, because I'm pretty sure besides Sarah and Game Changers, it hasn't really been used to sway votes too much. Well, yeah, true, and I, but I think the the fact that there is a, I mean, if if they do go to tribal council here at some point, or if say pre-merge, she ends up going and she gets like uh, into a swap and she only has like one other person with her, the extra vote could actually be pretty helpful. Um, I'm I'm I do agree though. It it does seem like extra votes haven't been utilized in the best way they possibly could on the show, but I think that just comes down to more so just the strategy behind people using them and maybe who's gotten them versus them actually being, you know, being able to be utilized well cuz I've I've as as you've kind of known, I I do have an org past. So I have been on a lot of um, other situations outside of the game here where I've actually been able to, like, play the game a little bit. And I've definitely seen some people use extra votes uh, way better in in online games than I've seen them ever use it ever on the show. So um, hopefully Maria can maybe break that trend. Yeah. To me, the way extra votes feel, it gives me the same feeling as the knowledge is power where people know about the they have it and then they become a big threat but they never use it correctly and then they just get voted out because of that. And it is interesting though cuz we do know Maria has one and Heaven has one here too. So um I mean not to I mean well, well if you're watching this you've probably already watched the episode. Um so to get on stuff later in the episode if orange and green are really like the two powerhouses here and they're kind of going to be the ones that are going to have the struggle back and forth for the numbers and they both know they have an extra vote. This could actually be kind of intriguing. Or at the same time too, it did seem like Tevin and Maria did kind of want to work together. So I'm also kind of intrigued to see if maybe they do. And they both use it together and then be able to create some chaos with that. That'll be 
really great to see. Mm-hmm. Have two extra votes be used correctly on the same vote. This is, I, I don't know about you. I, I don't feel like green or orange at this point is going to be a solid force at the merge. It seems like we have, we're seeing a lot of cracks in these groups. And, or even not even the merge, even a possible swap. Because we could see a swap in a couple episodes. Um, I don't think any of these two are going to be cohesive. Whereas purple, considering that they're going through so much so early, actually might be a little cohesive, which is one of, I think, the advantages of, um, to some degree, bringing that problem tribe in the beginning, because you do get the ability to go to tribal council to get those, um, really, there's no other way to really make bonds in the game than to vote together with somebody and to really find out where they stand. So I feel like so some degree, purple could be in a better spot here if green and orange, you know, continue to dominate like they have been here. Yeah, I don't know, because we've still, still seen some more cracks develop in purple. We haven't seen the ramifications of Banu after the Tribal Council, and Q has been gunning for Kenzie, so if they, they get on the same tribe, but then but don't have the numbers, they may turn on each other, and Kenzie might actually uh, blindside Q there. Very true, very true. Actually, let's let's go and jump into purple, because they were, I feel like, the focus of this episode. Um, outside of, you know, a, 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 a name scene here with Venus and a name scene here with Ben and Charlie. Um, but I, I feel like everything on purple, especially following their first tribal council, it felt it feels like this group is really feeling like the stress of having lost, um, especially in the beginning of the episode. And I think this is probably what leads to his reaction at the end of the episode is Bonnie was on edge. He starts the episode on edge. The survivor paranoia is hitting him really hard and he's starting to worry that there is very few places for him to hide in the tribe. And what kind of starts off a lot of the problems with all of everything in this tribe is the fact that Kenzie goes to Banu to comfort him. And at this time, while she's comforting him, Q and Tiffany realize how really good socially Kenzie is. Now, this is the first time we're kind of seeing that Kenzie is um, getting a lot of heat on her, because in the first episode, everybody loved her. So it was actually a very strange transition then uh, to get Kenzie following the situation, having a, a moment to herself, actually, where she starts crying at the fact that she has she's kind of um, not expecting to be as weak as she is being at this moment in the game um, from how hard like the adjustments to the physical aspects of the game are. And I thought that was actually a very telling scene. I was very worried for her. At that moment, because I was like, okay, well, this could be her swan song. But this also is a very good moment, I think, that could lead for her in a storytelling aspect. If she's somehow able to get out of the situation and make it to a swap, make it to a merge. That she has a lot of um, people coming after her, yes. But it's also a kind of a good sign, I would think, to some degree. Because it does mean that she is capable and she is actually doing things in the game. And they were able to give her that type of scene without having her to give a flashback to her life as well. Oh, which we already stand. Thank you, no sob stories, even though she was sobbing while this story was happening. Uh, I felt that could have been an easy place for them to like, oh, here's her sob story right here, and they just didn't do that. I feel like that's one thing that they've kind of held back on this season. Other than maybe Ben. I don't I can't really remember anybody whose like backstory they've been really pushing on us here. They had a uh, Venus this episode with one. Mm, I don't remember it. Cuz she was talking about <laughs> how people are perceiving might perceive her as like getting everything she wants and coming from oh, her own yeah, being yeah, Persian. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, you are right there. Um, which does make sense, because Venus is definitely a shining star on her tribe. Um, but yeah, it, it, it does give me both positive and negative vibes here for Kenzie. I, I still kind of attest to the fact that she's giving me a little bit of the Kelly vibes of last season, in that she's already being talked about as a huge threat. And we know that she is a 
huge threat. So I'm I'm just very concerned that she's going to last too much longer here. Um, but I I'm definitely rooting for Kenzie. At the same time, though, too, um, we have Jess, and she's still struggling. She's having a hard time socially, and she's deciding to eat ants instead of talking to people and making strategies or making strategies with anybody. Um, Tiffany noted that Jess is probably the nicest person ever, but she's extremely awkward. Um, I I have to say that I I do agree with Tiffany here. I don't know what Jess is thought process is here with what she's trying to do to integrate to the tribe um what are your thoughts on jess at this point uh, i i feel sorry for jess because she has she hasn't made it easy for her to get integrated into the tribe but then they also keep on piling on to her like they're expecting her to carry these like eight blocks by herself and she's just not that strong or big or tall and then they get mad at her for not doing that. It's like, it just feels like, yeah, she's not integrating herself well, but then they're also kind of piling on to her really unjustly, it seems. I do think that their expectations of what she could probably handle are probably a little bit too high, <laughs> especially given the fact that they should know that, you know, she hasn't been eating. She's probably malnourished at this point. I mean, they're all malnourished at this point. And I, I, I definitely think when they came to the challenge, oof, that that was a moment. And I want to get to the challenge in just just one second here, but I have one last thing that actually came up here on Purple, um, that kind of actually was a, a really interesting scene to me, um, in that we have the scene here where Kenzie takes Banu and Jess out into, um the ocean or the lake or something shows them some nice view i don't remember what they were doing exactly um i don't think it was anything important i think they were just walking and, and talking at that point um but kenzie at that point seeing how strategic she could possibly be floats out possibly voting q or tiffany at that point to banu and jess and they both are kind of like eh, i don't know i thought that was so weird that that whole situation kind of went down and the fact that Ken or that Jess literally goes back and immediately throws Jess or Kenzie under the bus the cue about it I was just like oh like this is this is the messiness like I think this is the moment where the messiness later in this episode starts is right here at this moment exactly I pinpointed it yeah, it feels like that's, like, showing, yeah, Jess and Banu do not know, really, the game too much. Versus the other three that are trying to actually play it. Where they don't even think of trying to take out Q or Tiffany to save their own bots. Isn't it so cringe, though? Like, that that is literally your perfect opportunity to just say yes. Someone comes to an alliance, you say yes. That's like rule number like four in Survivor. Um, like first rule is like, don't be weird, Liz. <laughs> but, um, you know, like rule number four, you say yes to an alliance whenever someone asks you. And the fact that they said no, or this, they, they weren't giving anything, I, I, like, it, I think that was really bad for Kenzie, though. Because now Q and Tiffany know that she could possibly turn against them. And at the same time, too, Banu and Jess have no strategy. So where is she going to go in this tribe if, if something goes down? I think she immediately, at that moment, put herself on an island. And for Kenzie, I'm really hoping that she is able to get to a swap. So I would like to see what she could possibly do in a swap. Yeah, unless they somehow win the next immunity challenge, I don't know how she would be able to make a swamp. I think they would be keeping Banu around for just for strength. And to know that he's the devil that they know, and they don't really know how Kenzie would be on a, a tribe swamp. I'm very kind of interested to see where Purple is going in this game. Um... But before we get there, actually, and, and you actually brought something up here that we need to talk about here, is which is the challenge. Um, 
at, at this point here. I, I, I'm actually enjoying the immunity challenges here. I think they're kind of fun. Um, this one here uh, was a lot like the opening challenge from Survivor Kageon, which I think has kind of become a staple in uh, the Survivor community here at this point. Um, so just to kind of recount what happened here in the challenge, uh, one member has to untie their tribe's machete, chop a rope, and release wheels to build their tribe's cart. And then once they do that, they push their cart through a maze, digging up chests. And once they have all their chests full of puzzle pieces, they rush to the end and try to build a standing word puzzle of the word persistence. First two tribes to do that will win. Now, before the challenge, which is something I brought up earlier here in the in the our discussion here, and something I, I was very like weird about this episode too, was there was an exchange where Purple was trying to defend their decision of taking out Jelinski, and it seemed like there was a tiff between Q and Soda that just kind of came out of nowhere, and they started, like, beefing back and forth. And I'm just like, where did the side of Soda come from? Because I was not expecting her to start, like, just, like, placating back to, like, the, the pettiness to the situation. But she was. And I'm just like, where is this negativity kind of coming from? Like, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this? Like, did you think it was weird? Because I thought it was really weird. I thought it was kind of weird because it's like, you're the ones that are like making fun of them and then they fight back and you're like, how dare they do that? I gotta go after them. And it's like, you're the ones that are making the jokes. Like, it's like, they're just returning your energy. I'm wondering if they're building Orange up as maybe like villains. Like, we're not ever going to get a villain again on Survivor. I understand that, Jeff. But I wonder if, like, they're being built up as the, it, well, I wouldn't say the villains per se, but if you want to look at Survivor as, like, a story and our winner as, like, the hero in the end, um, I wonder if they're being built up as, like, the adversaries, the bosses, the big bosses that our eventual winner has to take out to get to the end. Yeah, that makes sense with all what else has been with Soda about being selfish and everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we can definitely get into um, a little bit more because Orange does have a, a scene post immunity challenge here. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what happened in the challenge here. Um, so initially, uh, Green and Orange get their carts together at about the same time and make their way out to the course shortly before Purple, um, who is actually keeping up, but they're just always feeling like they're one step behind here. Um, even when Green kind of struggles to get their chests up, um, and orange takes off. Purple still isn't really able to make too much time back up on them. They're always one step behind moving forward. Um, now, one thing that I thought was kind of funny while all this was going on here is we do flash back to the sit out chairs and we see Liz and Mariah, um, who I thought were actually like possibly twins or sisters or maybe mother daughter. Um, they're having a, a fun little uh, bonding moment over their equally nerdy appearances, which I thought actually could have been maybe a good story point for Mariah, because her whole um, edit in the first episode was the fact that she feels like she has a hard time bonding with people, and the fact that they're showing her having a very clear moment bonding with someone who's kind of very similar to her and that actually could have been a very good sign for mariah there even though we haven't seen really too much from her else it was in this episode and the fact that they were able to speak to each other with the benches pulled apart after the incident in i think 44 i believe oh not miss claire not miss claire yeah claire, claire trying to so say yeah, that was very smart. And Survivor said, yeah, no, we don't like that. So I should say, no, we want more of that. Because I feel like if you're sitting out the challenges, you're typically at the bottom of the tribe. So having an opportunity to kind of make relationships with somebody else who's kind of in a similar position of you on the other tribe, I think that's perfect. Because then that just means that later on in the game, when they actually get to meet up together, we could possibly see these cross-tribal alliances form that otherwise really wouldn't have between, like, people that really shouldn't have power. I, I think it's actually rather intriguing. I would I would love to see more of this, personally. Because we could also see another, like, uh, type of play where J when JT gave his idol to Wrestle and Heroes versus Villains, we could see something like that happen again, which would be very messy. I would live for it, though. I would be here for it. Give me, give me more. Give me more drama, and I'm all for it. <laughs> So, 
Mm-hmm. We'll get we'll go back to the challenge here because um, eventually at some point they all make it to the puzzle. Orange gets there first. Um, we've been green, then purple, and I, as always, it comes down to the puzzle. And it seems like everybody figures out the answer persistence pretty easily, but it's the spelling of it and putting up of the pieces that is the hard part because it looks like these pieces are really heavy and everybody seems like they're having problems with it. Um, Orange almost gets it complete at one point, but then they have it spelled incorrectly and it seems like purple is getting really close and then they fall. And then we, for the first time in a long time, we go to a commercial break in the middle of a challenge. Which I was shocked about. Like I stepped out for a couple seconds during our watch party for. I was like, okay, the challenge will be on. I'll come back. I'll, I'll just. I'll see who wins really quick, and I can always come back later. I come back, and they are still challenging. Confusion. It kind of reminded me of uh, in Worlds Apart where they had that word scramble. I think they actually did go to commercial, and it took them like maybe an hour or two just to figure out the phrase. Oh, I do remember that when they were literally there for hours, and Jeff had to give them so many hints, and they still. <laughs> yep. You do love those world apart flashbacks that I would never ever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely love them, <laughs> unless it has to do with Dan. Yeah, let's not let's let's not. Talk yeah. About yeah. Not talk about I'm good with a podcast without him. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, to finish the challenge off here, Orange um, eventually gets the puzzle together first, and they come in first. Shocking. Um, I, I gotta say, I was not expecting an Orange tribe to ever dominate in the way that this Orange tribe is dominated, but I'm still feeling like this train wreck presence is there somewhere. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. There. I, I, I said in the beginning that they were the winner. I don't believe it anymore. I don't believe it. I don't think Orange has the winner. We went from like the opposite of Ghost Island, where purple dominated, orange lost everything, to now orange dominating and purple losing everything. Well, who knows? Green might come out of nowhere and snatch everything out of here too. Um, but it does come down here between green and purple, and it just seems like purple is just very chaotic because we have Q yelling at like Jess every two seconds. Like every single time something goes wrong, they're blaming Jess, and then you have like Banu like putting, like, five blocks on his back and then, like, dropping them and then starting to go into these chaotic screams. And I'm just like, what is happening here? These people are, like, panicking so much. And it's just, like, it's not helping them. And it's, like, it feels like the moment they finally, like, take a moment and breathe and Q starts to, like, direct them, they kind of finally start making some sort of progress. But by the time that this happens... Green's already finished with their puzzle. So Purple loses again, and they have to go back to their second Tribal Council. Before we go to Tribal Council, though, um, we do have a moment back at Nami, or the Orange Tribe, uh, where they should be celebrating their victory, but instead Venus is just pissed off that they ran over her foot with the cart. (laughs) Um, Venus tries to voice (laughs) her frustration that she doesn't feel like anybody is listening to her to Soda, but soon realizes that Soda is kind of part of the problem. Uh, we do have a montage of giving Venus the immunity idol, and Soda immediately trying to take it out of her hands, not once, but twice. And at this point, Venus vows that if she does make it to the merge, she's done with Orange, and she's flipping on them immediately. I think this is setting up for such an amazing possible storyline down the road. I don't know if Venus is our winner, but I think she's absolutely going to be someone that we need to watch, and we will see her for uh, I think she'll be around for a while here. I, I don't get vibes from her that her story is a one and done. I, I do kind of feel like she could be here for the long term. Yeah, I think she's going to be able to turn what should be a very typical boot order with Orange into something very chaotic, turning a lot of couple winner pre uh, season winner picks into pre uh, pre jury boots mm-hmm. and we could get into that in uh, a few moments here um when we talk about our predictions but let's get into this tribal council because <laughs> oh, oh boy. my god this the last like 20 minutes of this episode i am still just like what is happening because i went into this thinking i'm like purple 
this tribe is going to dominate. They're so amazing. And they're literally falling apart just minute by minute. Um, just like their blocks today. <laughs> uh, d- literally. And, uh, did someone on purple, was it something on purple that the block fell on their head and they were bleeding? They said someone was bleeding. Was someone on purple? Because it feels like um, I think, tribe uh, I thought, here. I thought I saw some a, a bit of blood on Jess. I mean that wouldn't surprise me. They were they were slaughtering Jess. They were they were murdering her with just their words alone. So they didn't even need to use the box. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we get back to camp, and Tiffany is upset, and she has her crying breakdown moment of the episode um, because she's worried that how she was acting at the challenge is going to look really bad at her and reflect negatively on her on the other tribes. Um, I'm not as worried about that for her because I feel like while the challenge was happening, everybody else was too involved in what was happening in their own challenge. So I don't think she has anything to worry about that. But I do think a lot of what her frustration comes in is the fact that they're losing. They've lost twice now, and she really is working really hard. Tiffany is actually... uh, Tiffany and Q are definitely the, I'd say, the strongest and the most strategically sound members of the tribe. So I would be just as upset for them to be kind of stuck in this group here with one this crazy and one could say they are the Malcolm and Denise of this tribe. Mm-hmm. More Malcolm and Denise. Are, wait, are we saying that Tiffany's that old? Wow. No, with Banu uh. being the Russell Swan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, possibly that that could actually be a good metaphor here because An- Angie could be our Kenzie, as we learned, because it looks like a uh, Kenzie, Q, and Tiffany have decided to stick together, at least initially, from what they've said. And they come up with the plan to get Jess to find a fake idol that they're going to plant so that she plays that and not her shot in the dark. Now, this is hilarious because Tiffany literally probably just drags her to the place where the idol is hidden, and it's kind of sticking out a little bit, and Jess cannot find it. So they have to resort to a plan B. They have to literally get Q, to, <laughs> who is the closest to Jess, to literally just give her the idol and say, hey, I'm giving you this idol, but you have to vote for the person I want you to vote for. Now, what I kind of think is interesting about all of this, right, is we are under the assumption that Kenzie, Q, and Tiffany are the power trio, but when Q gives the fake idol to Jess, he tells her she has to vote for Kenzie. Now, this is where all of this drama, I feel like, starts here, and we're going to kind of track this here as we move forward through it so it's not too confusing. So at this point here, Jess has a fake idol. She goes to look for it, or she goes to look at it, and she immediately becomes sus of it because it looks just like all the other beads from, like, tree mail and all the other decorations around camp, and she confronts Q about it. Now, at this point, it kind of seems like Q is... (laughs) leaning more towards this flake plant to vote out Kenzie. And he kind of realizes that he does have influence over Banu and Jess's vote, but he won't make the move without Tiffany. So he sends Jess to go talk to Tiffany. Throughout this whole time, though, Tiffany has wanted Jess out. Tiffany is done with Jess. Tiffany thinks Jess is the most socially awkward person and cannot find a reason to even like one positive comment about her. Like, she literally goes through the pros, cannot find one. And now we have Jess talking strategy to Tiffany to try to get her to change her mind to vote out Kenzie, who was someone that was kind of already on her list of people that could be a possible threat later on down the road. But while Jess is talking to Tiffany, Kenzie actually approaches them, which has to shift Tiffany's mindset as to who she's going to throw out as the decoy vote. And she throws out Banu's name, as she's obviously not going to throw out Q's name, because Q is her number one at this point. Now, through all of this, Jess decides to go back to Banu and Q, tell them that, oh, they don't want to vote out Q, they want to vote out Banu. Now, Banu loses it. He is officially, he's already on his last leg here, he's already had one foot in the crazy door. He's officially put both hands and he's doing the hokey pokey and turning himself around at this point because he thinks he's now the target by the girls. Even though it seems like it's pretty obvious that everybody kind of wants Jess out at this point. And the blind side would be Kenzie. So 
Anu is now apparently in the mix of this plan. What are your thoughts as we head into the Tribal Council vote? As what this pre-Tribal Council mess was? I thought that even though Banu had like gone a bit paranoid about his name being out there, I still thought that it would probably be Kenzie to, to be voted out because it seemed like they showed us that Q had wanted to work with Jess and Banu to blindside Kenzie there. It also felt like though Q didn't know what he wanted to so do. That seemed like it was like going to go down. He wanted to do one thing. And then he was like, well, but I could do this thing. But I could, let me just have the option to do both. But then it was just very strange. I don't, I don't know the way he went about it. It was just like, I, I don't, all he did was, I feel like instead of like making things easier between the two, he made it worse because instead of like shutting down the Banu situation, I feel like all it did was open the door now to Banu now thinking that he is the target. And that is where we kind of stand as we head into Tribal Council. And I feel like that Tribal Council, it, it did at least the editing, made it seem like it was going to be Jess or Kenzie. I mean, Jess literally says to Kenzie that they didn't talk strategy for the day. So it does seem like at that point that it is going to be Jess. Like, I, I, I my writing was on the wall at that point. I was like, oh, like maybe, maybe they could do Kenzie. But it seems like it's Jess. But then, out of nowhere, just literally nowhere, Banu decides to bring all of the attention on himself, having this extremely intense reaction. And honestly, this I, I'm a fan of his passion. I'm a fan of his speech. I'm a fan of, the, of wanting to do well in the game. But what the fuck is that dog? <laughs> Yeah, like, what just, like, why did you do this to yourself? Like, it almost became, like, an unintentional Zane from Philippines referencing that season again, where he's basically trying to get himself voted out without any intentions. It's like, if, if you're in a game a strategy game, and it's all about, you know, you, you don't want your name out there. Why are you going to yell at the top of your lungs? <laughs> hey, I'm here! Help me out! Like, and, uh, like I get but paranoia. Him, uh, Survivor paranoia really is real. It could kind of lead you to do some crazy things. But, and and, and I kind of, I, I, I sympathize with them, because I, I know if I was on the show to some degree, I would probably be having an internal reaction of how he's feeling, especially if I'm in that same kind of position with him early on. Cause I'm like, I built this up in my head for so long and now I have the possibility of being the second boot. Like what the hell? But like all you're doing in that sort of situation is self-fulfilling prophecy. You can't have that mindset. You have to immediately talk yourself out of that paranoia and let it go, especially when nothing else has led to him thinking that he really should be the target. Like, do they, does he really think that he would be gone before Jess? With well, him hearing from Jess that Tiffany and uh, Kenzie didn't like his emotions, that maybe he, he thought that they were going to try to take him out and blindside him. Because uh, I believe Tiffany did say that she didn't care about uh, tribe strength. She was caring about what type of uh, bond she has. True. And what's going to take her throughout the game. I just feel like it was maybe we're just not seeing it. But it, it just feels like to me it was very clear, especially in the last round, that if it wasn't Jelinski, it was going to be Jess. Like, Bonnie was nowhere nowhere out there and i get it there's smaller numbers now so if it's not jess who else could it possibly be but at the same time though like bro you gotta keep that shit together you gotta keep it together <laughs> you gotta like, have more. a filter like yeah, i think we're gonna season. get another uh keith neal situation where we're gonna see Bono go <laughs> and i think we should stick to the plan yeah that was one thing they were bringing up about bonnie was the fact that even jeff knew 
who his alliances were. Jeff was like, so what I'm gathering here is that you're aligned with Kenzie <laughs> and you're aligned with Q and you're aligned with Tiffany. So guys, let's do Jess. It's like, <laughs> even Jeff is calling you out on that. Ooh, like you are not doing yourself yeah. any favors trying to, and like it, this could be a situation where maybe we're learning all of his faults now and he has time to, um, you know, make up for them as the game goes on. Like maybe, maybe purple goes on a win streak here. Uh, maybe he's able to get to the merge and hide beneath bigger threats like Kenzie and, and Tiffany and Q who are definitely all bigger threats than he is. And so it's possible things could get weaned down to the point where it's just him left. I, I could definitely see that happening here. I'm just wondering if that happens. Can he actually keep it together to play the game, to get to the end, to have a winning shot? I don't know. I kind of, I kind of hope for the chaos of everything. I would love nothing more. Cause just because like, it feels like everything here at this point has... Every every one of these tribes, it feels like they have conflicts to the point where I can't imagine any of them sticking together long term. So I'm very interested to see, since especially since we got a very straightforward vote tonight with everybody voting Jess and her playing the fake idol, um, which she knew was fake. Um, and I think once she played the idol, I think all of us were kind of like, OK, it's probably Jess here at this point, because if she, you know, if if I was Q... Um, I wouldn't let someone play a fake idol knowing that it was fake um, and let them stay. So uh, yeah. at, that, at that point, I was like, okay, it's probably Jess. Um, but, you know, if if Purple goes to the Tribal Council, and we could we go and we could jump into predictions out here too. Um, if Purple goes to the Tribal Council, I don't know what is going to happen here. I could see make a case for any of these people possibly leaving next. Even Tiffany, in a situation where, like, uh, Kenzie gets Q back on her side, and they decide they want to keep Banu, and they need to get rid of the idol, and they want to get the idol reflushed or something. Kenzie, obviously, is on the outs at this point, because Q and Tiffany already see her as a threat, and Q has this bond with Banu. Banu's Banu, so obviously he get himself voted out. And obviously, I mean, if, if Kenzie is this big of a strategic threat and she's already thinking about possibly getting Q or Tiffany out, then they could also possibly go after Q in the, the thought of, oh, there's possibly going to be a swap in the next few episodes. Let's get rid of Q. Like, I, I don't know where this tribe is going. I think, well, the first two votes have kind of been Q kind of <laughs> dictating a bit with him, like getting his way, because in the first one, it was, oh, Kenzie really wanted Jess out, but he was hell-bent again, Jelinski out, like, that was, he was like, I don't care what y'all vote, I'm voting Jelinski, Jess got Jelinski, Bonnie's got Jelinski, we're getting Jelinski out. And now this episode, he's like, oh, Jess or Kenzie, and then Jess is out. So I'm feeling if next episode he talks about Jess Kenzie, I think Kenzie's probably gonna be gone. I could see that. I mean, Q definitely seems like he is getting his way more than anybody else on the team. And with him and Tiffany being at the top here, I don't see any sort of way that Bonu and Kenzie are going to try to come together as a strategic force. So, um, yeah, I mean, I could see that happening. Um, I feel like with Tiffany and having her as a duo with Q, she's probably letting him take all like, oh, you have the decisions right here. So that people will see him as more of a threat than she will. So that she can just slide through, have him be a meat shield right there. Let's see that. I would love a world where Tiffany is able to kind of get through this and just kind of, you know, walk away unscathed and just set up for the next round of this game. Just in the best situation possible. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I could honestly, I'm still not sure. My thoughts on her plot. <laughs> like I'm like I need some time to say. Yeah. Um, I'm like I feel like I know how I feel a little bit more about the other tribes more than I feel about this one. Like uh, for example, we can just hop over to Green really quick. Um, I do think it's likely going to be Tim or Gem, just because we haven't seen very much from them. Um, but I also think I could possibly make a case for Mariah. 
possibly going to. Um, I don't see a world where Mariah, Charlie, or Ben are the ones leaving. I think I think they're getting the vast majority of the edit on green. And I mean, if Maria isn't planning on swapping on Charlie here, then I see a world where where those two are the two in control here. Yeah, I think if they go, I think Tim is going to be probably the next boot, unless it seemed that Charlie is making a final three and she sees that and sees that he's lying to her. She could do like a three, two, one split with Charlie and blindside him like that and keeping the women strong. Or use that extra vote to her advantage too and just vote with the women. There's plenty of op- Maria has so many options right now. I, yeah, I'm she, her spot here. Um, yeah, she. she is doing really good so far. I would have to say if Orange goes to Tribal Council next, I think this is another kind of interesting one because I, I I feel like for me they're building up a lot of other people. I still feel like it would be Liz. I don't I don't understand how Liz makes it deep into this game. Unless Orange wins every challenge. Maybe see a world here where we maybe possibly lose Kevin or Hunter. One of my winner picks. Or actually, just kidding. I'm going to rewind that. I think it would be Soda before Kevin or Hunter. Because I think they'll they'll need Hunter and so, or Hunter and um, Kevin for challenges. So I'm going to say Soda would be my first winner pick. Or my first blue pick. Orange. I would say Kevin would be the first blue because there's been so much of a... Distinction as Tevin has been this social butterfly. He's has bonds with everyone. So he would probably be the biggest threat to both Venus and Randon to get out. Is he working and with I, Randon though? I, I don't think so. I really, I really haven't me, seen that. For me, it feels like Tevin has... I mean, I know he has an issue with Venus. But it feels like the person that he doesn't really connect with really honestly is kind of Liz. Like, it feels like every single time Liz is talking to me, he's just like, oh my god, shut up, Liz. Like, stop talking about your money. <laughs> like, he's the yeah. one that, that's noticeably brought up Liz's name more so often than anybody else as, in the negative. Yeah, I feel like I don't think Liz will be the first one now because I feel like it seemed to shift from, I think we only maybe had that one scene with Liz, but I feel like we had much more negative from him and Soda against Venus. Well, for Liz, it was just Tevin, really. I think that's why I have Soda as my personal pick is probably next to go. Um, just that I don't know if it would be Tevin or Hunter. But can I can possibly, just because Hunter's name got brought up in the preview, maybe I could see Hunter going. Um, I just don't know how blatant they would be about that in the preview in setting up his boot. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm leaning, I'm leaning a little bit more towards Soda as as my first orange boot or Liz, which was kind of what I was thinking anyway <laughs> initially. Yeah, I think I would lean toward more Tevin than anything because he seems like more the mastermind of the entire tribe. I will say, I I think. I don't know if I could put Tevin. Actually, I'm I'm having a hard time narrowing down my top three winner picks here, just because everybody has red flags at this point. I don't know if there's anybody who's not giving me something that I'm just like, oof, oof. I mean, even just being just being on purple is a red flag at this point because you have no numbers. Um, I. I feel like with having a top three with this type of season, you gotta go with like your bottom three being your top three winner picks. Oh lord, don't don't say that because then it would be like Soda, Liz, and Landon. Like I think we have. I could see it. Yeah, yeah, Landon or Banu. I don't even know if I had Banu at the bottom of my list. I like I'm just. <laughs> He's just so much. Like I, 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 I'm trying to think if he could possibly like maybe reel it back in. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like literally, I think I could put everybody as my next to go, and also as my winner pick. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
Everyone's either a winner or the next boot. Let's see. If if I if I do have to narrow it down now, um, I am still going to put Tiffany in my top three. Not just because, well, mostly just because I'm still rooting for her really hard, and she's my personal favorite. So if I'm right, cool. Um. But I also just feel like out of everybody from Purple, she's giving me the most well-rounded in it. She's not, like, super confident all the time like Q is. She isn't, like, super uh, strategy-oriented and constantly trying to, like, max at people like Kenzie is. She's not super emotional and, you know, going over the top constantly like Banu is. So I just I feel like I get the best vibe. If anybody from Purple is going to win, it will be Tiffany. So that's why she will be in my my winner picks of the top three. Yeah, I also have Tiffany in my top three because she's shown to have to know the game, and she's said that I'll cut you if I need to. Like with talking about Kenzie. Who was initially one of her number ones? And I believe that. I think she really would too. I think she was about to cut Kenzie this episode, but I think she also realized how uh, valuable Kenzie is too. So um, definitely was, I think, for the benefit for Tiffany for just to leave versus had, I think, Kenzie left, that would have been much better for Q. So I, I do edge Tiffany as well. Um, who's your next winner pick? Ah, uh, I kind of feel like maybe Ben, because of how, like, messy this game feels, someone like him could just kind of slip all the way to the end, and because he probably won't have any enemies at the end, he'll just be, like, the de facto winner, because people don't may not like what the other two did, or the other two haven't really done anything, and they just like the dude. Kind of like maybe, um... The winner from a uh, Bob from Gabon, or kind of like a like a Fabio, or Fabio, yeah, yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Um, I don't necessarily think I have been in my winner, my top three just yet, but we do have to look at the fact that he's getting so much attention and what this means for the edit, just because like he's getting a lot of unnecessary attention and a lot of scenes here where we are learning a lot about his backstory more so than I think pretty much anybody else in this cast at this point so Ben is either going to be the fan favorite or I I can see him winning but I don't think I'm ready to get on that bandwagon just yet Um, I do think there's two other people on green now that I'm kind of looking at um and I, I think one of them is kind of related to Ben. And I'm kind of very shocked that I'm going to say this right now. Uh, but I can't deny that Charlie has been getting a lot, a lot, a lot of screen time here. And it's always in what feels like very intentional places. Like they, his edit feels very crafted to me. In a point where, like, they 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 even have like the narrative jokes from the first episode with Hunter and, and not liking someone or not being able to connect with someone who's Taylor Swift, and then you know there's just a lot of things that or today even in today's episode they had that stupid scene where Lennon and Charlie were naming 107 Metallica and Taylor Swift songs. Like, there's they're getting their content from Charlie. And there's there's something about just the way that they are editing him. I, I can't deny that I'm having trouble not being like, okay, is Charlie a possible winner? Am I just, I think I'm probably reading into things here. Um, but I, I have, I bumped Charlie up this episode. I have to. Yeah, it did, <laughs> it did seem like this episode, the only reason we went to green was because of Charlie. We had Charlie and Maria just or Charlie talking about being in the middle or Charlie challenging Ben. Like it he got really most of the he was only basically the only reason why we went to green except for the very beginning when Ben did the fire. 
right? And it just it just feels it's the same thing with men. It just feels unnecessary. Like it's not anything towards the story necessarily per se. So we have to kind of look at okay, what are these what are the editors showing us who is prominent in that way? And for me, while Tevin kind of fell out of focus a lot, Charlie kind of took a spot for me. So I don't know if he's on your top three, but he, he's definitely someone that I am immediately intrigued on to see where he's going. That yeah, he is not on my top three. <laughs> okay, well, give me your third. Your third top three. I guess for right now, it would have to be Venus just because of how she's been edited. Where, like, when she was looking for the idol where most people would, it would be like, oh, I found you looking for the idol, and you're being sneaky. But then with her, it's like, oh, I'm going to tell him, and then the person she told is like, oh, she's being sneaky right here, but we don't see it. And the same thing with Soda about her being this ice queen, but we don't actually see it. While when we hear her talk about Soda being selfish, we go to multiple flashbacks of Soda literally trying to take the idol from her hands. It just seems very intentionally trying to showing some of that negative, but then also guarding her so that we don't see her negative attributes. We only hear about it. I can kind of get on board to that to some degree, but I do feel honestly like the new era edit is a lot less forgiving than a lot of the old school edits in that I, I feel like they would do a lot more protecting of Venus and a lot more explaining for me personally if she was the winner. I feel like there's something about Orange narratively now that is just it's it's not sticking with me right for some reason and I'm having a hard time getting on board with any of them because like you said there it seems like there are definitely some editing flaws that were kind of missing to some degree and I could still see a world because like I said uh, I was not um on board with Reba last season I was doing I, but I think that was actually like a, a subconscious thing where I was like just reading into everything else hoping that the Reba 4 weren't going to be like the the people who make it to the end um but there's just I, there's something about um Orange that I'm kind of getting a similar vibe but maybe uh you know I just I I'm just, I'm having a hard time getting on board with them now. This episode, was, I don't know if it was good for them in my eyes, so I'm just I'm having a hard time really thinking anybody from Orange could be our winner. I don't know if this episode was good for anyone, like... Right, right. Just, no, <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> just everywhere here in this whole mess, like, woo. It's like, for as, as good as I felt about, like, going into this season pre, pre-season, I was like, oh, I could see any of these people winning. And I'm like, now I'm like, yeah, I could see any of these people winning because it's a hot, shitty shit show mess. <laughs> <laughs> like, anything could happen at this point. Anybody could be taken out. Anybody could win here. Um, I would say, though, for, for my last pick, um, I, I was kind of actually feeling this person preseason a little bit more than I think more people were feeling them. And I'm kind of actually very intrigued to see her get a very good edit thus far, even though I'm, I'm a little worried now. I'm still thinking she might be built up as like the Dina of our season. Um, but I'm gonna put Maria as our, my third pick here just because she's had two very 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 good episodes she's shown to make great decisions um i haven't seen her make one decision at this point that i'm questioning she's in control of green clearly um my biggest worry for her though is that it's just she while she wants to kind of break that mom stereotype i don't think that her um demeanor and the way that she kind of just is as a person, she that she's going to be able to hide that. I think she's going to definitely be a target. I think people are going to know that as soon as like they swap tribes, that she's going to be the one in charge. I just have a feeling that Maria kind of has the relationships at this point. So, I mean, even Tim is now on her side again. Um, she has Charlie. She has Ben. She, I mean, she has everybody on green. No one is going to be trying to get rid of her 
as a threat on green. It'll be someone on the other tribes that will be trying to get rid of her. And she's made a relationship with Tevin. I was going to say she made a relationship with Jelinski, but he's gone. Um, I just, I, I feel that she's been showing me that she has been making the most positive and the most correct decisions up to date to this point. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's uh, a winner here. I mean, same thing happened again with Kelly last season, uh, where she was kind of, you know, person that was kind of shown to be constantly correct in a lot of decisions. And then she got blindsided halfway through as our big threat. So um, I could see the same thing happening to Maria, uh, but I, I I get really good vibes from everything that she's doing right now. So um, I have to say I'm going to kind of stand in her. Yeah, I feel they have been building up Maria as this big presence in green as the leader. But I feel like with this type of season, it just feels like whoever it like looks like is going to be the leader probably will go out early with how messy it already seems like. Yeah, that's my biggest my biggest like red flag with her. I think as we talked about tonight, everybody on this cast has red flags now, which is insanity to me to think that we went from a cast that I was like, wow, these people are like, they seem like they have it together. And now I'm like, oh, shit, no, no, they don't. No, they don't. (laughs) We could literally be on the end, the ending here with anybody could possibly be winning here. Like we could literally be, I'm going to say now we could possibly look into the Bonnie win. And I'm going to be sitting here on the finale night and be like, remember when I fucking said that as a joke on week two? But remember when I said that you were there the day that I was like, I think Gabler could possibly win. Oh, yes. And we, we all, all know laughed how that, that off. Happens. So I, I'm never, I'm, I, I can't discount anybody. Even though we have our favorites, the edit will lie to us. So really, honestly... Unless we've seen spoilers, who knows what's going to happen here. Um, that's the fun part about this, is the speculation and the talking about it. And um, Doug, I just want to say thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight and talking about our favorite show together. Um, I want to give you the last word before uh, we end uh, the podcast tonight. Uh, what are your final thoughts heading into uh, these uh, last... Or, no, it's not last week episodes. Well, we just fucking started. <laughs> Well, what are your thoughts as we what are your thoughts as we get into uh as the season really starts to pick up here moving forward? I think that if it continues to stay messy and gets even messier, we're gonna have to basically throw out everything we thought we knew about the edit and just get blindsided by maybe even a gem win. <laughs> Loki, honestly, I, I feel like this is that actually is the true, but maybe the exact opposite. Because if we're looking at a season that where it's just going to be crazy, then the edit might be the best thing that will tell us who will get far. Because we need to be looking at maybe those subtle Bob type characters that are just always consistent and always positive. Uh, that could possibly be our winner. So um, who knows? Really, at this point, um, I'm very excited for next week. Very excited to kind of revisit this at the end of the season, just to kind of see where our headspace was were at when all of this craziness went down. And honestly, I'm just very, very excited to uh, see what Survivor 46 brings to us next. So I, I think that'll be our podcast for the night. Um, I, we've gone for way over an hour here. I want to thank everybody for listening tonight, Doug. And thank you so much for hanging out tonight. We'll definitely make sure to get you on again uh, before the season ends. If you would like, we'd love to have you back. Yeah, I'd love to be back. Thank you for having me on. And just like Jelinski, you will be back for a future season, Doug. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, On that note, y'all, thanks so much for listening. Hope you had a great time and hope you are enjoying the season. And get some comments going down below, y'all. Let's keep this tea spilling, y'all. On behalf of Doug, My name's Renegade, and we're signing out. Have a good night, y'all. Bye!